Welcome to The Journey, Hopkinton Center for the Arts web series where we meet fascinating artists and learn about their paths, where they come from and where they're headed. I'm Jerry Shea and today's guest is my friend, actor Lauren E. Banks. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Lauren. I'm going to introduce you, tell a little bit about you here, that you were born in Durham, North Carolina. Um, Lauren grew up playing basketball and, and uh, had a, an eye toward becoming an Olympic track athlete, which I didn't realize until I did a little bit of research on her. But fortunately, she chose a career in acting, and we're all the better for it. Lauren attended Howard University, studying under the late Al Freeman Jr., and graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in uh, theater arts acting. She went on to earn her master's degree in one of the top acting programs in the world, the renowned Yale School of Drama. And before she graduated in 2017, that still amazes me, uh, Lauren was awarded the Yale's, Yale's Carol Finch Die Award, an honor given to a graduating actor in recognition of their artist, artistry and commitment, which certainly describes Lauren. Um, her, this prize was previously given to actors Frances McDormand and Meryl Streep. No surprise there either. Uh, not long after, Lauren won the role of Siobhan Quays in the Showtime series City on a Hill opposite Kevin Bacon and Aldous Hodge, and that's where we met. Uh, Lauren's previous credits include Dietland with Joy Nash on Hulu, the feature film thriller Plain Fiction, and Netflix limited series comedy Maniac with Jonah Hill, Emma Stone, and I noticed Sally Field on that cast roster, too. If you've seen the show before, you know that I have no problem asking my friends to visit, especially my friends from City on a Hill, and I could not wait for Lauren to join us. You're so kind to do that, Lauren. It was a thrill to watch her work on set and to see her power on screen. In watching her work, I believe we're witnessing the launch of an important career. Lauren's voice will be heard on film and TV, and I trust on stage at some point as well, and uh, also in society as she speaks out against injustice. In June, Lauren stood with the social justice organization Until Freedom in Louisville, Kentucky, protesting the brutal murder of Breonna Taylor. She was arrested along with 86 other peaceful protesters, and she considers that moment to be, in her words, one of the more divine experiences of 2020. She'll undoubtedly be, be, continue to be a strong voice in the fight against racism and injustice in our country. And for her passion for justice, for her incredible talent, and for her friendship, I am honored and grateful to introduce Lauren E. Banks. Lauren, thank you so much for giving us your time on a Sunday morning, on your day off. Yes, day off for sure. <laughs> How are you doing? How are you holding up these days? You know, uh, very hopeful these days. Yeah, like... Yeah. Very hopeful, very inspired. Um, I'm amazed that we're able to be back in the saddle with City on a Hill, mm -hmm. considering. So um, it's just wonderful, the, the ingenuity and adaptability of our industry in that regard. Um, and, our, and our spirit, right, for everybody to get back to work in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah. And yeah, of course, we've had an election week as opposed to an election day. Yeah. And that's been pretty awesome as well, just to kind of be alive and witness what this is in that experience. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I, I try never to presume um, anyone's preference in terms of politics, but um, I just know that everyone that I've spoken with uh, in the last 24 hours is thrilled. Uh, and, it's, you know, I would say on both sides of the aisle with this, with this, uh, what the voters decision was, you know, um, uh, that at least we can move on and with a lot of hope. For sure. I also think it was a nice, I don't know, at least in my experience, the first time where it really truly felt like everybody was in the game, if you will. Like, and that in and of itself is also inspiring in terms of, you know, advocating that every vote be counted for the most part, you know, yeah. advocating, um, you know, that everybody's voice be heard and that more people felt involved. It felt like, oh, when it comes down to a couple hundred votes in my big entire state, my vote really did matter. You know what I mean? Like the thing, my act of civic duty uh, mattered. <laughs> and and that's a good thing for people to be seen and, and felt um, considered. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, this, the, the, the stuff about, you know, the, the, the controversy that's pops up every four years or every eight years in some cases to the electoral college. It's interesting that 
um, you know, it's there for a reason and it has worked for a long time and it's kept some sense of fairness and in some cases perhaps unfairness. But I think that that, that in a state like Massachusetts, which is my home state, um, people think, well, you know, a Democrat's always going to carry the state and do I really need to show up? But I think it's important to have that popular vote out there too for that real mandate. For sure. Yeah, the popular vote matters. It, it helps us understand where the people's voice is, even if that state, you know, electorate doesn't go in that direction, you get a sense of who is your neighbor and, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. things they believe in and care about. So that's that's very important, I think. Yeah. Yeah. How have you how have you, you know, with all the stuff that's happened since we worked on on season one of City on a Hill, I, I, I am, we would never have envisioned what has gone on in the world. Um, and and how things really gr literally ground to a halt here. And, I, and I, I've been in touch with our friend Tom Fontana um, mm. you know, since we got to know each other working on the show. I have, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he, he's saying how complicated it is to restart something like this. So there's certainly been a lot of willpower involved and I'm sure a lot more money involved to get a show back up and running like this. So that's got to be exciting to know that there's a level of commitment there. Uh, yeah, it was very reassuring to know that Showtime and, you know, the whole team was like, we really want to see this come back. Even yeah. um, from a fan standpoint, you know, my my DMs are blowing up as we're going through this pandemic. And they're like, so when is City on a Hill coming back? And I'm like, are you serious? Well, that's a good thing. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm happy that people feel that way. Um, it's, it's, it's very reassuring of the work you know, that we're doing that storytelling is is a tradition that people still want and need despite mm -hmm. anything. Um, and yeah, and I really am thankful for the way in which Tom and the whole team uh, from, from Joe Time, but, you know, also the executive producer team, like everybody's taking it very serious. And it takes us about 30% more time to do anything uh, mm -hmm. is how they calculated what, what the COVID procedures and protocols uh, require, but I'm, I feel very safe. <laughs> and that is, I think everybody does. I mean, feel very safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, we can laugh about it, but also it's very serious. It's a very serious thing to, to feel safe and to know that as you go back home, you're not, you know, you're not um, putting anybody in danger. Right. For sure. Um, and so 30 percent more time about how they actually increase the number of days per episode. I'm just curious on how that's affected well, your schedule. Well, it's affected us in the sense that we're block shooting. For yeah. example, we started yeah. working on the finale Friday. <laughs> I had a feeling they would be doing that. Yeah. And, you know, so all the directors are here everybody's working like all the directors for the whole season. It's not like, Oh, we'll see such and such in a few weeks. It's like, Hey, I'm back. Now I'm gone. I'm going to go edit this. Now we're here. And, you know, and uh, you know, from an actor standpoint, it really requires that we really be on our toes. But the beautiful thing is if you come from like a theater tradition, you're used to learning the whole script anyway, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in advance. So for me, that helps me understand the arc of my character better. And I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do it. I think that's great. Yeah, to have that sense of story, that that, that longitudinal sense of story is it's gonna be ter terrifically helpful. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine I'm gonna say a quick little prayer to myself for the PAs who've got a lot of people to wrangle. <laughs> hey, say another. I'll say another with you. Yeah. They're they're they're, uh, they're a great team. Wow. Now, how have, you, how have you managed to stay grounded through all of this stuff and the ups and downs of this opening a show, pre premiering a show like City on a Hill and having the, the response to your performance in particular uh, uh, has been so strong? How, and then, the, you know, the, the tragedies in the world, too. I mean, how do you keep a steady course in all this? You seem so serene about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so. I think I think a lot of it has to do with like... Um, you know, my daily, my day to day practice um, in terms of, you know, I, I pray in the morning, I meditate in the morning, <laughs> you know, I uh, talk to my parents regularly. Parents will always keep me grounded. <laughs> They're like, Hollywood is cute, but, you know, here's who you are, here's who I am, and uh, these are the things, how we relate. Uh, but yeah, and just, having being grounded in space and time and understanding what my purpose is why i'm here it kind of keeps me understanding you know in alignment in it all and not feeling off center too much or at least knowing where center is when i do get off balance if yeah 
Yeah, you know, that makes absolute sense. And it, you seem like someone who has been so grounded. And I, I, I was thinking, you know, gee, you know, you so quickly have started to work after you graduated from Yale and, and had the success through your training. And a lot of people would say, oh, you know, what a meteoric rise. But I'm sure after after several years of training as an actor, you've been an actor for a long time already, as young as, as, young as you are. Um, you've been at this for a while. So there's just this is not a an overnight thing uh, for you. Um, but it's it's remarkable the, with the, the grace that you have taken on when you won the role of Siobhan Quays. You know, there you are playing opposite Kevin and playing opposite Aldous and working with, you know, right, like, you know, Chuck McClain, Tom, Jorge Zamacona, you know. Um, <laughs> like yourself and Jerry. Oh, oh, you're sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it was a great cast as, as uh, Kevin Dunn, uh, who plays the DA on yeah. the show, um, says it's a real murderer's row. That cast was phenomenal. Uh, is, there, is there anyone in that? I mean, do you still get when you're on set there now? Is there a sense of excitement about that? Gia, you know, how, how do you feel about this? Is it is it old hat to you at this point after 10 episodes and plus, you know? Yeah, yeah it's certainly not an old hat. No, I'm I'm learning. I learn something new pretty much every day. Yeah. Um, and it is, you know, I, I say that first season. I had a lot of 430, 415 pickups. <laughs> and I remember feeling excited every morning. <laughs> and then after a while, I'm like, okay, am I okay? Why am I still excited? Why am I? But it really, you know, every new scene is a new adventure. Um, working with new day players is a new adventure. You know, like staying alive to the thing I think is is the joy and and the blessing of the work we do, but also like that is the job to stay alive and within it and not allow it to get kind of stale, um, you know, from doing Broadway, like you can't really, you know, let it just let that wonder or sense of curiosity go away. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I, you know, whether it comes naturally or I have to say, all right, like what, what can we go find today? I take that with me into the work and and it's, I mean, it's always a delight to show up and work with Kevin Bacon and Aldis. And, and, and um, I mean, they have such a, a canon of work, the two of them, um, and Jill Hennessy. And just, you know, I never, I never forget that I'm working with, with the people that I watched on TV growing up. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And the same, and I'm quite a bit older than you, obviously, am, but I still every day on set, I would just couldn't wait to get there, too. And I, that's that's the key. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I attribute it to that, but I think you're understanding. You, you sound like a theater trained actor to me and, and not that film and TV people don't understand this as well. But yeah. there's such I think that we have a common ground in sort of the way we came up through Ron Van Loo's philosophy, of, you know, in training and I'm sure other influences on your your work, too. But just that idea of staying alive to the work, to listen and, and to re respond and to take in who is there on set and lock in on it is uh, is a thrill. I just equate it, it is. And I think I'm sure in block shooting this season, um, mm -hmm. that's going to be that's going to be your superpower to be able to do that. Yeah, no, one thousand percent, and being able to um, also, you know, chart chart the script and have an understanding of where I am, so I can lock in. Okay, here I am. Here's what I want. Here's what I need. You know, do do do, and then go get it, and and then leave that scene. Yeah. Run upstairs, get changed, come back down, rehearse for three episodes later or three episodes before. So yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. I yeah. I love I love what we do for the sake of learning something new every day. Yeah. We're pretty lucky. We're pretty yes. lucky. This show is called The Journey, as you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in it, we, we explore the artist's path, um, you know, where you sort of what your roots are and sort of where you came from and that brought you to this point. Can you tell us a little bit about your early life in Durham? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, you know, I was born and raised in Durham um, and I went to a a glow, it's called a, um, Burton Geo World is like, um, it's an international baccalaureate school. So my schooling kind of came from it, international baccalaureate schools are obviously all over the world and they have a global perspective of education. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been something that I've grown to appreciate about like just what my experience in Durham was growing up. Um, and how I think that 
transitioned me to want to have a very big curiosity about the world outside of North Carolina or the world outside of Durham and traveling with theater and acting and everything. I'm curious uh, about how art came into your life. Were there any artists in your life and where does the, the gift for storytelling or even the interest in storytelling come from for you? Um, well, art, uh, like it's a very artsy city where I grew up, but um, additionally, my parents um, loved art. They love music. I grew up in a house where music, if it was Sunday morning and, and like this, the music would be blasting through the house and it would be, either, it would start off with like maybe some gospel and then it'll turn to funk, you know, music. And then, you know, it'll maybe be modern day, like R&B by the middle of the afternoon or something. Um, but that was a thing, like music was a thing. My dad was a musician growing up. Um, and yeah, I think had he had different kinds of resources around him, or maybe if he was grow, grew up in Durham, he might've gone on to continue to be a musician, or at least he's, mm -hmm. he's told me so. Um, my mom is a really great writer and still is. And um, she loves to, to write stories, read stories, tell stories. And so does my dad, like the oral tradition of storytelling is just a thing in terms of our family and how we relate to each other. We sit around the kitchen table and we tell stories. Like that is our entertainment. We'll, we'll cook food, it'll be a cookout, but then the highlight of the cookout every single time is the whole family sitting around the table, debating and telling stories from their childhood. And, um, and, and I mean, they would make these stories, I mean, whether it's my dad telling a story about how they built a go-kart for the first time, you know, or uh, or the one time they got uh, in big trouble for trying to steal BB bullets from the store because his big brother said that was a good idea. And it's like all of these really good stories um, that were told in full beginning to end with such detail that you felt like you were there. Um, that, you know, I grew up, experiencing um on both sides of my family so that's a thing and, yeah uh, the, those oral traditions and writing whether it's formal or otherwise and and you know your mom being a writer and your dad being a musician which i think is storytelling regardless of whether someone's singing along with lyrics or not uh, that paints an interesting picture of someone you know that you came out of that um those yeah. disciplines yeah and, and, and the weird thing is they they were surprised when i wanted to be an actor they were like wait what <laughs> it was like, if you would have said you wanted to go into law great uh medicine we got you but like yeah we don't know anybody who acts professionally and were they scared yeah no doubt yeah but they weren't they didn't stop me just like i guess everything else i wanted to do i was like they were like so you know what this is going to be on you <laughs> mm -hmm. you gotta figure this out um and i was like okay fine and you know, they had offices and I would go to the office so much that I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer and I knew I didn't want to be a doctor. So I was like, but I would be at the computer in their office using search engine, which was Ask Jeeves at the time. And I would search how to become an actor. Um, you know, them telling me it was on me was everything I needed. So that's like, okay, fine. I'll, fig I'll literally figure it out. And they were like, we'll support you, but you have to lead the way. And that's basically how it went. Oh, that's the best. And, and you know, I think of, uh, you know, you being on teams, you being in clubs and being a leader, um, working with Ron Van Loo, whom we mm -hmm. both love. Um, you know, I, I know that there's such an ensemble atmosphere around NYU, which is where I trained, as you know, with Ron and, and at, at Yale. Uh, that sense of ensemble, for, whether it's from a team or from, from the theater training, um, is that something that you uh, felt you came to naturally or yeah, yeah, yeah well yeah I think well I grew up an only child um for the first 15 years of my life so I was always happy to be around an ensemble whether it was a cookout or going to my cousin's house or whatever like I wanted to, I I I think I sought that out in general I think that's why I loved um being on a track team why I love being on a basketball team um you know in mm -hmm. embracing you know, being around people and having fun together and, and, and then of course, creating something together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, me and my parents had our trio and that was fun too, you know, for the first few years of my life. But um, 
yeah, I think I, it definitely came natural and it definitely um, was the thing that even just be, having, being put in those leadership positions, because I remember when my drama teacher said, you're going to be the drama club president next year. And I was like, but I thought that was a position for seniors. And he was like, yeah, but I think you're ready to do it your junior year. And I'm like, yeah. okay, <laughs> you know, and then other and, and, you know, I, you know, as captain the best of a basketball team, you don't choose that. It kind of chooses you. Right. And, and I think those are also things that came natural for me and being like, OK, team, let's do it together. Yeah, well, that's that's a good sort of impulse to um, to have the confidence to go at that job and then say, OK, to draw people together as a leader. And that's that's real. I, I, I just have this. Um, word that comes up um, from time to time when I meet certain people. Um, and it, it's a word that I, I had never heard used before. It's the word folksy. Um, mm. Paul Walker, who was a, a, just an amazing uh, theater games teacher at, at NYU and, and several of you know my classmates, we all just think of him with such great fondness and love. And he would say, oh, he describes someone as folksy. Mm. Um, and, and I understood that to be, I, I realized what that meant was someone that you can envision at home, among family, mm -hmm. uh, authentic, grounded, rooted in family and friends and community. Um, and as glamorous as you are, and you are a glamorous television star, by the way, I would say. Wow, thank uh, you. I, 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 it's, it's amazing. I, I'll never forget showing up in jeans and a leather jacket at some event, <laughs> some premiere in New York when we were filming last year. And then, and then I'm on my way out at some point and you were on your way in with your friend and like, I couldn't like, oh, that's what this event is. I should have taken a little more seriously how glamorous you are. Oh, that's so sweet. Thanks. You're always like fantastic. And, and and I would still, on the other side, of it, I would describe you as folksy. You have this balance of that. So, you you know, you sort of reach for these heights and you attain these heights uh, in your career. And, you know, it seems like you know how to do this. And, you, and yet there's this folksy side of you where family is so important. Mm -hmm. um, do I have this right? Do you I feel like there's that, that balance? Yes. yes, yes. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, family is very important to me. And yeah, and I like, I like to play and, and explore. And yeah, sometimes that takes you to other places. But yeah, it's, I think it's, again, just having, I have a thing where I say, you know, um, and I share with people, you know, keep your feet on the earth and your head to the heavens. And it's mm -hmm. like, it, you know, your body is extended in two different directions and that that's okay. <laughs> you know, your person, uh, extends, your spirit extends in two different directions. So long as it doesn't go, you know, yet you're not like down here and you're not like too up there, then you're, you're good. <laughs> That's so great. That, those are words to live by. You know, I have a, another memory of, of you on set, uh, actually, you know, behind, you know, behind the scenes in, in our dressing room area. You were hosting a large group of students from I think it was your high school yeah. um, uh, theater group. And you you had your teacher then. I'm not sure. I forgot his name. Mr. Tab, Wendell Tab. Right, right. And, and you were just so gracious and respectful of him. Um, and, and of the students there too, you were so gracious with that group of kids that came through. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you're teaching and, that you, and I'm not surprised that you're teaching and sort of giving back there. Um, yeah. I, that's just a memory I have that I just, I, I just want people to know that that's who you are, where somebody else might just not have that headspace or that time or the ability to, you know, to focus on other people when they're about to go on camera, you know, yeah. maybe an hour later. Well, the thing is, Mm -hmm. I, I get that and I, I recognize that and even in some of the students that I work with um, but I even when I'm teaching I'm like you know you know it's not about you right like it's not <laughs> um, when you're telling the story it's not about you it's about the people you're telling the story with and the people you're telling the story for <laughs> um, and and there's this beautiful moment moments that occur in storytelling sometimes um, where it feels like you're like, wait, am I even doing this? Is something else doing this? Because I just feel like it's coming through me and out of me and to me. And, and I'm kind of like up here observing this experience that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I aim for that. I aim for that in my daily life, in my work. I feel super free in those moments. And I feel like I am being used 
in a healthy, true way when that experience happens, whether I'm on stage, because I truly believe like I'm doing my best work or I'm like allowing my best work when that happens. And, um, and so, you know, I think a lot of the work as an actor and even as a person, like getting out of the way and allowing life in and whether it's walking down the street and or experiencing being American, uh, uh, you know, being a character, I think it's all, all a part of that. I hope that my students that are tuning in here are listening to hearing these echoes of, of lessons that I, you, you hope to instill in students, allowing your best work, not deciding it or pushing it, but just allowing that to flow through you, setting it up, set the table for it to happen. Totally. Uh, honestly totally. And, and truthfully, that's so great. Mm-hmm. So your parents must have been very gratified and proud and maybe a little more encouraged and, 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 and calm about this when you, you, you were accepted at Howard University. Totally. You know, so if you're going to study theater, if you're going to go into this, uh, you know, Howard University seems like a pretty good place to launch. I think I almost killed them because, <laughs> because they were like, yeah, of course, you know, you applied. And so, OK, what schools are you applying to? Well, have you applied to? And I was like, Howard. And they were like, yeah, we know you want to go to Howard. What other schools you, have you applied? Or are you applying to? And I was like, Howard. And they were like, you only applied to one school? I was like, yeah, we'll go to Howard. <laughs> and they were like, Lauren, no, apply to No, go apply to schools right now. I remember the day they realized that I had only applied to one school. And I was like, I don't understand. I'm going to go to Howard. And they were like, we appreciate your confidence. However, <laughs> apply to Carolina, just in, you know, research other schools just in case i'm like fine i mean i guess but yes once i got in yeah and that relief came over that was great and i think my parents you know were also like you're gonna be my dad was like okay well theater major yes um and once i think when i got serious about it again was like my sophomore year um right after the summer before my sophomore year and they were kind of coming around to it Mm -hmm. um but once I started doing the productions and, and of course, like getting lead roles and they were like, oh, wait, she's actually, she, there's something here that they became invested in like, oh crap, is it, you know, she got to get into Howard, she got into Howard, but now she has to get into the program. Like they mm-hmm. only take 16 people a year. What the heck kind of program is this? <laughs> you know? Um, so I say all of that to say they were um, thrilled. <laughs> that I got into the school and then of course the program. And um, and then on orientation day, I think it was orientation day where my parents attended because they were all moving me up, the three of them and, uh, and my little brother. And the teacher spoke, each teacher for each uh, department and each um, like acting in each class spoke. And after the orientation, my dad said, you know, I don't think you're gonna have time to be a theater major and and major in business or a theater major and even a minor in business. But it feels like these people are serious about preparing you for the future. I have confidence in that if you don't, you know, want to be a business major, you have my blessing not to have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, thank mm-hmm. God. But yeah, it was a very serious program and they set the tone from the very beginning about how they were going to prepare and train us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a, as a dad, I know that's that's uh, a very calming thing to hear. You know, when they they they've got you. You know that they, they, you know that this is not some sort of fly by night situation where um, you just kind of give it a shot um, to prepare uh, your child for for a future. And what is a very difficult line of work. You know, the work itself is. Uh, I don't tell anybody, but I'd pay to do it. You know, uh, but it's the life around it to get the jobs to survive and to, to build your life around it. That's where you know it gets really difficult, as I know you know. Um, do you feel that you, I mean, you've got a really good team around you. I've gotten to know just, you know, just kind of in arranging our schedules around this interview, um, this conversation and um, other things, but you've got some good people around you advising you at this point, I'm sure. Um, do you feel you're at a point where, or approaching a point where you can be selective in the things you involve yourself with, the, the project? Yeah. I think um, I think that's important from the very beginning. I always say, or my idea of what success is, having your own definition of what success is, I think helps you be clear on how to be selective. Um, You can look at somebody's career and say, I wanna be like that, and that's cool, but I think you look at someone's career and say, hmm, what is it about what they have that I think makes sense for me? 
Mm-hmm. Take those parts, take those parts and build what you understand for success to look like for you. Mm-hmm. And I just know that I spent a summer right after school doing play readings, uh, table, table work and auditioning. And I was having the time of my life because I was waking up, working at a high level and do, still you know, and doing it in a way with people that I thoroughly enjoyed and believed in. We all came to the table excited. And I was like, oh, this is the feeling I want to have. I'm not getting paid but $25 for this thing, but this is the feeling that I want to have, continue to have as my career progresses um, because that is what's going to make me happy. Not being, you know, admired for great work, but being able to wake up and be happy doing the thing that I love with people I love. So my definition of success that some are solidified as work I believe in with people I believe in. And so long as I'm doing that, I feel successful (laughs) and I feel happy. Um, And then that, that steered me through getting to city on the hill. I said, Oh, this script work I believe in and these people, people I believe in. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. It's so important to personalize your version of success and, and to take, like, I love that idea of sort of taking what's there. What is it about it that works for you? What is going to make you uh, feel successful? Because you're the one who's going to ca- carry that, whatever that is that you have taken on um, throughout your life. And you live with the results of it too. So uh, it's very wise to, um, uh, to be always thinking about how does that, what is my version of success? That's so, so great. Uh, with such strong roots in theater, uh, I, I, I wonder if you get this question. I, I get it almost on a weekly basis um, from, from students, but stage versus film versus TV. Do you have a favorite at this point? Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, storytelling is my passion, mm-hmm. is what I learned. Um, when I produced work with the Howard Players, um, because I was uh, leading the Howard Players at that time, which is our own student um, theater production company at Howard, kind of, yeah, it's just a, like the student run theater production company. Um, and we, yeah, I, I, I produced a, a play. I think it was Our Lady of 121st Street, uh, Stephen Hadley, Gerges, and or Gerges, and I was like, "This is amazing! I am happy! I am enjoying this! I love making this, bringing this story to life! I enjoyed the casting process! I, I enjoyed supporting the director! I enjoyed the team! Yeah. And yeah, I yeah, it's it's fun! I I enjoy directing! Like I I enjoy telling stories." Yeah, I think that's a really it's a, it's an aha moment. I know I know it was for me years ago too when I realized, oh, I, I don't need to be the one in front of the camera or on stage even. You know, uh, I, I I love the story as well, and, it, and you know, it's in recent years it's it's manifested itself more in, in writing, um, in, in writing music and in, in right. writing screenplay, and you know, in, in producing when you know that you can put the elements together, and now you've got the experience from your from your uh, undergraduate years uh, to go by. Do you see yourself in the future? I know you had mentioned to me when we were rapping for the first season of City on a Hill, uh, you were talking about writing. Um, are you are you pursuing that at this point or are you thinking about producing your own works at this point? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As busy as you are, yeah. yeah. And that's why I say, when I say day off, I'm like, yep, that, those are my days. My days off from City on a Hill or, my, or when I'm having my writing sessions with my co-writer. I'm Great. like I'm working on a pilot and we're in we're into the third act of the pilot. It's been really fun to learn how to develop a TV show, which is, you know, creating a Bible and everything for the characters. Um, yeah. And I think after season one, that summer, I finished my first screenplay. So Great. go figure. It might be about an Olympic track runner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds of that? Maybe. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just directed a short in January, just, j- just before se- the start of season two. You, oh, you just directed a short. Oh, mm-hmm. I can't wait to see this. So when do we get to see this? Well, the thing about it is the short is now it feels we have, gonna, we're going to use it as a proof of concept for a series instead. Yeah. It may be mm-hmm. later, mm-hmm. but um, we are submitting it to festivals. So 
when we hear back from festivals this summer? I will be patiently waiting, but still eager. Right, so now. <laughs> right that'd be great. Um, I, I wonder, you know, there's so much going on in the world. We touched a little bit upon that, uh, but I, I want to be sure to touch base. Um, I was just so impressed with hearing about that experience, just, just reading a, a line about it in your bio. Uh, about what happened in June um, in the wake of the Breonna Taylor murder. Um, you know, as a, as a woman and as a person of color in this industry, um, there, you face challenges, obviously, that I have never and never will face, um, and, and many of us never will face. As you, as you make your way in this world at this point, do you think where things are now, are we turning in the right direction? Are we heading in the right direction to any I degree? Think, hmm? I think so. No, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think... Um, Hmm. Yes. <laughs> and what is the shortest, ver what is the short version of this? I think, you know, it's, it's something I learned about myself in, in this is specifically as it relates to Breonna Taylor and getting involved with that work. Um, like, When, when I learned about what happened to Breonna Taylor, um, and w it was at the same time that, you know, other things were erupting as related to George Floyd, as related to Ahmaud Arbery, um, and, you know, there was a lot of social unrest in general just because we were experiencing a pandemic and, and then the fallout of the lack of, you know, proper response to a pandemic. And, um, I understood very specifically that it, it, I didn't really have to think much about it as it relates to getting involved. It was, you know, at first it was a visceral emotional understanding, but very quickly turned to, I knew exactly what I had to do and, and how to do it as it relates to organizing because of my experience, um, even organizing as a student at Howard um, around Trayvon Martin, but I understood that this was what happened to her would not be um, if, if it would not be recognized and 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 taken with the level of seriousness and care if people didn't decide to do something about it, right? They didn't decide to get involved, didn't decide to very specifically put themselves in the way. Um, of making, acknowledging that this was something that we were not willing to accept. This is a reality that we weren't willing to accept. And so that was my understanding. And so I began organizing marches in, in LA for Breonna Taylor, LA for Breonna Taylor marches. And then very specifically when I'm for Till Freedom said, hey, we need people to come in, in directly to Louisville it was a no brainer. You know, it was, it was clear that calling over the phone to the elected officials, you know, sending letters was not getting through to even having any kind of transparency for the general public in Kentucky in Louisville and the country that cared about what was happening. Anyways, that is to say the response was very immediate and direct in terms of going to Louisville for me and, 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 and very quick, you know, I prayed about it, of course, I considered it, I consulted my parents, they know the child they raised, they were just like, yeah, you know, do what you feel you have to do, be safe, I got a COVID test, I was in Louisville within 48 hours, right, um, of getting my negative result, and so the pro, we participated in that particular protest, and um, I guess, as to answer your question in whole, um, I think there are a lot of people who are having those moments where they're saying to themselves, here is a reality that I'm not willing to accept, that I can't accept. And the whole, you know, there's a quote that says, you know, um, learn to accept the things that you cannot change and change the things that you, you know, you cannot accept. Um, and I think this, this uh, national reckoning, this global reckoning as it relates to um, policing of policing in general, policing of black bodies. I think the global reckoning of, of humanity and acknowledgement of humanity. I think every, a lot of people are in different places saying, 
here is something that is happening and I have no longer, I have no longer refuse. I'm, yeah, I refuse to continue to accept. And here's what I'm going to do specifically and directly to make change about it. And I think I've met so many people through organizing this summer in LA, in Louisville, in North Carolina, um, in and around, you know, uh, organizing for the election, I, uh, knocking on doors, you know, mm-hmm. um, in North Carolina and getting people to the polls. Um, I think this election shows us with the unprecedented number of people who even just said, here's something I can't accept. Here's what I'm going to do about it. Even if it, you know, is casting about or, or, you know, potentially putting myself in danger to go do this thing, uh, during a pandemic, which is voting. I'm going to do it. And for that, I think, yes, yes, yes. We are moving in the right direction because that's happening. Great. And I'm very inspired by it. Lauren, I'm really struck by something, you know, it's all of what you've said uh, about this. And one just being um, toward the beginning of this, um, I I, I just want to sort of underline for myself as well um, that, you know, you know, we can we can have feelings and perspective on this stuff. But if we don't decide to do something, get involved, put ourselves in front of this thing uh, to take some action, it, all of this really this momentum could go away quite easily because we've seen it. This is not like the first time these uh, these horrors have happened in our communities. Right. So, um, you know, yeah. what is the best way that that people can be involved? And, I, you know, I am certainly one. I am in listening mode mm-hmm. as much as I can be. But I also worry that I'm not doing what it is I can do. You know, I, I talk to friends about it. I push back on something. If someone says something I, I can't agree with mm-hmm. about it, but what else can we do um, about this situation that keeps the momentum going, keeps it in the fore and, and, and doesn't allow it to, if the dust to settle. Yeah. Well, I think two things to the point that you just made um, in terms of keeping the momentum going, but also just the day to day things. I think we can't, discredit like truly taking a strong stance against something right like against something that we recognize is symptomatic of the larger issue right and whether it's a conversation where you're like you know I can't you know I can't I can't accept that I can't continue to welcome that or ignore that experience or what comment that you made because that is hurtful. And it, and I think in many ways we can look at those situations and say, oh, but it's not hurting anybody. Those words don't hurt anybody. But we, we know I this country is based on ideals, right? Like, and those ideals do permeate this like spaces and places and they do have impact. Um, they're shared, uh, they're taught um, to children, you know, all the things they have real consequences. So I think not definitely not discrediting the very simple minutia of like human exchanges as it relates to creating change, right? I think um, there's great privilege in being able to get on a plane in the middle of a pandemic to get access to a COVID test, to be uh, to, to to be healthy in a place to to put myself between uh, or put me and those eighty six other people to put ourselves between uh, resisting a way of being or resisting the system mm-hmm. and, and, and a future that we believe in, right? Like, um, I have friends who very much wanted to be a participate in the protests I was doing in LA, but they were immuno, you know, compromised, immunodeficient. So there were other ways that my friends were like, how can I help? Well, I need a lot of money. You know, I need a lot of PPE. Can you donate PPE for the people that are coming to the protests? And they did that. Um, can you, you know, they're just like, oh, I'm just going to send money. You buy snacks. I was like, yeah, because we need snacks for the medics because people get overheated and, you know, excited. Like all of those things are so important and critical. And, and we couldn't have made things happen without um, that, that input. So just knowing that every in a grand symphony, everybody has a part to play. Like, you know, every, and there is no music without every single note that creates the music, you know, um, keeping that in mind is, 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 is a big, big deal. And then, you know, and of course challenging ourselves, okay, here are the things that I'm doing, but how how can I do more? And that was like 
my challenge for myself was how can I do more? And aligning with people who are generating those ideas of the future, like some people say, you're an activist. I say, well, I don't know that I'm an activist. I don't, I don't, I, I activate, um, I advocate, um, but I know activists, I know there was a point in my life where I really truly considered whether or not I wanted to be a career activist. Um, but I understood, I understood that I remember very specifically having a moment where I felt like the universe and God and my ancestors were speaking to me and letting me know you are a storyteller. This is where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I also know that I've had very specific moments where that's, that same spirit said, and as a storyteller, here's where you should go <laughs> and, and to do this thing or to be in this place. Or as a person, because yeah, I'm a storyteller, but I'm also a human. I'm also a woman. I'm also a black woman, and these are all things that I care about, right? And um, and I and I'm a storyteller because not just because I am a storyteller, but because I truly believe in the liberation of humanity. I believe in being able to show our our best selves and like and and being you know truly curious about the world and understanding the habits of humanity and being able to for allowing us to learn more about ourselves through the stories we tell, through the characters that we get to bring to life, um, to reflect back to ourselves. So, you know, I think that that grows me as an individual and I be- truly believe that grows us as a community, as a society. So I mean, I say all of those things to say, don't discredit the part that you play and then the part that you can play beyond yourself, if you will, um, mm-hmm. as it relates to um, being involved because I I was in Louisville for I occupied Kentucky for 30 days we were there after after that first protest we left came back and organized another one um, and other people um, participated and then we were there for for over three and a half weeks organizing working with people getting people in Louisville registered uh, to vote um, re enlivening and engaging that community that their community was hit. The children in that community were hit by this very specific social, you know, tragedy. <laughs> this this tragedy that happened in their neighborhood. Her friends, her family, people that she took care of. Yeah, you know, she used to pick me up. Her teach her. She used to give me rides with her sister, her little sister. You know, all these things were important, and there was incredible healing in being able to tell a story. There was incredible healing uh, with. And, and um, I didn't know it then, but it was necessary to be able to tell that story later. And I wrote and I shared it in an op-ed, you know, um, and that was necessary to help things move forward. So, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question in, it, in different ways. It does. I mean, in a very eloquent way, too. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the grander things that we can do being on the front lines and in larger ways, as you say, beyond ourselves. But I love the idea that you, you know, you, you shared just about the brass tacks of this, you know, we need snacks, you know, we yeah. need PPE money, you know, yeah. as, as mundane as it is, this is the, the practical stuff that allows this work to happen. So if someone cannot be on the front lines for any reason, you know, compromised or otherwise financial reasons, there are other things that you can do to be involved to mm-hmm. put your shoulder behind the wheel. So thank you for the thoughts on this. Um, you know, we have, um, sorry, you mentioned something something about momentum. Yeah. Momentum. And I think moments, and also it was another thought that I had, but momentum is such a big thing because I think that was something that I recognized that we had to make an intentional choice not to let the momentum die, if you will, uh, around this, because I've, witnessed it before and that's only but i only knew that we had to i had to make an intentional choice to to put my energy towards it this this movement and specifically galvanizing around um brianna taylor because i've i've seen it where we get really excited about a thing and specifically let's just talk about police like um police violence right there we have we have become, we are beginning to be accustomed to witnessing murder in the palm of our, uh, palm of our hands, right? And that in and of itself 
is something that we have witnessed like occur and happen. Like, so there was a time where we didn't, that didn't happen. And there was a time in which witnessing murder in the palm of our hands or our phones was terribly disturbing. And it still is, but it's becoming less so, right? I only say that to say what happened to George Floyd was one of those moments where we see it, we understand it, we know it, what happened. And there's no denying it. With what happened to Breonna Taylor, there was more work that we had to do to understand what happened and to allow our imagination to disseminate that information through our bodies and through ourselves, our humanity to under, to, to internalize it, to be able to then begin the process of empathizing with it. And then, you know, all the other things. And I'm, and I know because I've seen it happen with like a Sandra Bland before or just other movements where something happened and there's a big eruption and then everything calms down. And unfortunately, those really bad things, those brutal things continue with business as usual without us knowing about it. And it was a situation where I was like, I just can't, you know, we just can't afford to let that happen again. We have to choose to keep the momentum and keep the conversation alive in that way. If that Absolutely. makes sense. And then the other thing that Kelly was mentioning uh, on our little break, but Kelly, what we were talking about the fact that it was a, it's a time in which is the visionaries, right? The people that use their imagination on a daily basis, like artists, um, where as we keep that momentum alive, as we're doing work, there's also a place for people to begin to imagine what it looks like on the other side of where we are. Because, you know, unfortunately, even as we watch what happened with this pandemic, right? It was hard for some people to imagine what it looked like on the other side of a quarantine. Hmm. So they were just at the quarantine part and it was like, it's too much, I don't want it. I don't want to do this. I can't, you know, whatever. But if you could just hang in there and begin to imagine what it looks like on the other side of a quarantine, then maybe we can get through the hard, I mean, the hard part, which is the quarantine phase, which is the lockdown, shelter in place phase, and then begin to have something to look forward to. But not knowing what something looks like on the other side of something is so scary and just so daunting that people much rather stay where they are with what they know. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, I think if somebody is going to reimagine policing, then that is important too. Like, I think if people are going to begin, maybe your, your part isn't to be on the front lines, if you will, but you will have a solid plan for what it looks like to, to relate to one another in new ways or introduce new ideas. And I think that's highly important in this time too. Mm, absolutely. And, and of course, Voting, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we vote. Uh, you know, we have that act. That is a frontline move. You know, we can Absolutely. vote as we have seen, um, and to make real change. Um, thank you for for that. Uh, I I have so many questions, and one of them I I just if you if you have a moment to there were a few questions from our audience, but one I just want to ask you. You talked about envisioning what is on the other side of the coronavirus. What is on the other side of of this movement? What is your vision, say, for maybe at the end of this first term of a presidency or um, or five years out, even 10 years out? What is your vision for the world through through this work that you're doing, you know, and in, in being out there? Well, I think um, my vision is like, so if we're going to be in a reckoning phase, if that's what we, we say this is now, then I, I think, you know, and it's not, I think it's a collective vision with other people that I'm organizing with, right? But um, it is one where we have some reconciliation, right? Like there's some formal reconciliation, um, I think is important. I think that it's happened in other societies in the, in the, in the world. Um, and, you know, because of misinformation, we have a history of misinformation, you know, our history, even in education has a history of misinformation as it relates to, um, understanding each other and understanding our history. And I think you kind of can't have reconciliation without being able to take a very specific look at what has happened and how that has affected various communities from, you know, indigenous communities, um, black communities, brown communities, like how has affected everyone who 
who occupies this space. Um, and, and then to, to then be able to create um, programs and, and initiatives and, and different, different, thing, different ways to reconcile with what, what has happened, if that makes sense. You, you just kind of, it'd be nice if we could just put a nice, cute little new, you know, a bow on it with a you know, new president and just move forward. Okay, you know, that's happened. But I think, I think we kind of experience in America that, all right, there's more work to do than just having, seeing change in the Oval Office and that creates change all around, right? So I think, you know, my, my hope and the hope of a lot of people or the work I think that is left to do um, is to take every community, community, you know, space and, and city and state, you know, all, at one place at a time and, and do that work and allow those places to reconcile with each other, um, to have those kind of conversations. Personally, I imagine, you know, reconciliation talks. I think it should be a national thing. <laughs> like just in the same way we all had this very national conversation for the last week. I think it's worth it to invest in having those national conversations in various places where more people's voices are able to be heard and understood um, around different topics. Like we just go around, you know, different topics, lay them out, make proposals, you know, and have people who are interested in, in doing things differently. But yeah. And the work has just begun. You know, we, this, the, we a victory in, in, in the election does not mean anything is done. And uh, yeah, absolutely, this work is just beginning now. We're positioned to do something um, important and real and substantial going forward. Yeah. I love the idea of bringing that to the foreground as a national discussion just the way we all focused on who was going to be in the White House. We have national period. discussions about everything. It is literally pop like we will have a national discussion about this person's hair and this TV show. And we, <laughs> it's possible for us to have a national, you know, conversation. And then these breakouts that happen all over the country, you know, to have those local conversations. I mean, it's, it's true. It actually is possible. And I think, you know, that is, I think the further much further off, but of course there are things that can happen tomorrow um, from bills being passed to just, you know, uh, reform across the board, specifically with policing, specifically with things that are saying, okay, here's the problem that's happening. Here's, you know, here are the people that make this, that, that uh, create this problem, or here's how this problem is allowed within this system, right? Like, Here's how this system allows this problem to, to, to take place, allows these uh, tragedies to take place. It is really difficult to get rid of the bad apples when you can't see them, right? So maybe we create new policies that, you know, keep the bad apples from having, you know, maybe impunity. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I love the words that you use, reckoning, reconciliation and reimagining. So this is the, the process we need to go through. Not only is it possible, but absolutely essential. Right? Um, if you don't mind, I have, I'm just going to keep it to three questions and we'll try to move through these as quickly as possible. So I, I want to respect your time. I know we're a little bit over already. Um, number one, this is from Amanda. Uh, what is your best advice for someone just starting out? Do you recognize, uh, recommend getting a, th a degree in theater or just going to New York or LA or one of the centers and, and jumping in with, for classes? Well, you know, I think I definitely recommend getting a formal education in some way, shape or form. And I think you can do so as a theater major for sure, but you can also get, get training at different um, studios in New York, in even your hometown, uh, wherever you are, uh, community centers. But formal education, formal training is key. Key, key, key. I don't think there, you, you want to, you know, going to a center like a New York or LA and getting a job is just that, going and getting a job. But, if, but I think what artists aspire for are careers, and lifetime careers. And it'll, the training will allow you to do a lot of work when you're young, to take time off and to come back to it and continue to grow as an artist. 
Um, and and to, to ride that wave all the way out, as Ron Van Lu says, then one day you go to the grocery store, you know, you leave rehearsal and you're like, huh, that was a great rehearsal. And then, you know, you die, you croak right there. And, and that's okay. <laughs> he had that's a way with okay. words. He had a way with words. <laughs> Still does, by the way. Still oh, does. That's, yeah. Still does. So, you know, um, you when you invest in, in your in your instrument in that way, it becomes muscle memory and you have that artist in your spirit, in your body. And that's what you want. That's I love that. Investing in you, it's its worth it if you want it. It's, in, it's worth investing in you. That's so great. Um, and that's music to our ears at the HCA too. Um, um, question number two from Josh. Um, have you ever worried about taking a social or political stance and how it might affect your career? That's a... Mm -mm. No, um, I think... I mean, obviously, it's something that you consider. Uh, hmm, you know, here's how I feel. But I think if you take a social political stance just for the sake of taking a social political stance, then I think you have a lot of things to worry about. Um, but I think if you, if it's something you believe in, um, and again, I want to do work that I believe in with people that I believe in, and if I believe in them, they believe in me, uh, then I... I don't, if I believe something, I, I want to work with people that, that you don't have to agree, but if you believe in liberation, then I want to work with you. If you don't believe in liberation or liberation is something that is for everyone, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So and, and I can't imagine showing up to work and enjoying making a really great film because it's too much of a team effort, um, you know, to to yeah. do. And um, and so in that in that case, no, I think and I think that is the essence of freedom um, in, in being able to to embrace something that you believe in and 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 not fear not being accepted for something that you believe in because you'll be accepted by the people that you should be accepted by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the people find each other, the right people find each other. And, and yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, do you want to associate someone with someone who can't handle your truth? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and, and I will say that, you know, that's a growing process. Like this year, I, I grew in the sense of like, oh, like I am, I do, I, I organize that is just in my bones. You know what I mean? That is just a part of who I am. I care deeply about, uh, you know, these things, but truly what, what happened, for example, with Breonna Taylor, um, is not a political issue. That's a human issue. That's a matter of humanity. Um, and I think those things get convoluted. Um, but no, but when we're looking at life and I, cause I, and we're looking at how we take care of life in our country, that's about humanity, <laughs> how we preserve life, uh, how we uh, celebrate life. Um, that's not a political stance for me. And, um, yeah. Um, so. That's yeah. great. That's great. Um, and one last question. I, 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 I always love to ask. Uh, my friends, this question, um, and I just will wrap it up with this one, if, if it's okay. Um, what do you know now when you think about your career, your career as an artist uh, or, or the things that you care about in your life? What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started out? Hmm. What do I know now that I wish I knew when I started? I think at that time I was trying, I felt like I had to be this or I had to be that or I had to be this, or I had to be that. For example, um, if I was gonna be an artist, I was gonna be an artist. But then I kept being put in leadership positions. And I'm like, oh, but that makes me have to be, you know, responsible in this way and all of these things. And I, it was kind of compartmentalizing my gifts and um, what I've grown into in the last year even. And, and, and my gifts and just the truth of who I am, right? I was, those things are being compartmentalized. And what I've grown into and what I've learned over time is that um, all those parts of who I am are necessary to the person that I, and the woman that I was becoming. And to compartmentalize it was really to cut myself off from my, a part of my truth. 
um, and, and diminishes my power, therefore. And I feel like in this year, when I allow myself to be all of the things that I am, um, which is somebody who is painfully, you know, sensitive about human interactions and how we relate to each other and how we care for each other. Um, and I care deeply about that. Um, as well as I am an artist, as well as I am a writer is, you know, then I just felt so much of myself unlock. And I felt so clear and sure about where I was, what I was doing and why at every time, because I was following the whole part of my truth. And I wasn't saying to myself, oh, I just got to be an artist. Or I went into Yale saying, oh, finally, I can just focus on acting. But the truth was, it wasn't a burden to be <laughs> the drama club president or the captain of this or that. It was just a, a part of who I was. I am a leader. That is a part of who I am. And it's not a burden that I have to like, oh, it's just who I am. And the more I embrace it, the more I can just be like, this is exactly where I am, who I am and what I'm doing. And um, yeah, and I think the same after school as well, in, in the sense of, oh, I just, I'm just, let me just focus on this one thing. But yeah, as an actor and as a creator, I tell stories and yeah. Had I been thinking like that before, maybe I, my, my screenplays would have been done. I'd be producing them right now, you know. But now I know. Now I know it's all it's it's all up to you. It truly is, and and it's and it's and you need all of you um, to 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 live a life that you I think be proud of. That is an incredible, awesome answer, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you for carving out a bit of time with us today. Um, you know, early on in your process and your in your growth as a person and an artist, and you're just more proof that good things happen to good people. So just keep going. Thank you. I received that tenfold, and I thank you so much for having me. I I enjoy telling this story with you today. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank Thank you again, Lauren. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll see you again soon.